This is Jerry Sparks, president of AG Financial Insurance, and we have with us Rich Hammer, renowned attorney, tax expert, and uh, uh, risk management guru when it comes to uh, taking care of church risk management. And today we've got a big subject, and especially as it is summertime, we're going to talk about churches and summer activities. You know, one of the largest amount of claims that we see with churches happens during the summer, and that happens with camps. So do you want to start with uh, talking about risk management for, for camps? Yes, Jerry. Of course, when the weather warms up, the summer arrives, uh, there are so many activities that move from inside to outside, especially when it comes to youth and children's activities. And these activities are associated with, with a number of risks. And we want to talk about some of those today. Those that we don't cover, we'll, we'll push to a future program. But uh, so we're going to be looking at, at a couple of risks in particular today, those dealing with camping and those dealing with uh, any type of activity involving water. Uh, and, and so, but before we get into that, I, I just would like to make a few general comments that, that apply to any kind of risk. And those are to, to really uh, consider carefully whether a particular activity is just too hazardous to conduct for minors, especially younger minors, but, but uh, I'm addressing all minors, anybody under the age of 18. You know, why do you want to go rope repelling over cliffs? Uh, why do you want to use pyrotechnics in the uh, church parking lot? Uh, you know, there, there's just a number of risks that in my opinion are, uh, or, or how about trampolines? We're gonna be talking about that probably in a future broadcast. Uh, do you know the American Academy of Pediatrics a few years ago strongly urged that parents not allow minors to use trampolines? So if a church uses trampolines, because we want to stimulate the youth uh, and make, some, make it interesting for them to come to church, we're going to get a trampoline in the parking lot uh, or in the, in, the, in the yard of the church. And the problem, of course, is that's an ultra-hazardous activity no matter how much supervision or safety netting that you have, it doesn't really reduce the risks that much, especially when kids are doing somersaults and flips, which of course they want to do because that's what they see on, tel on television. And the, in a recent year, I think it was 2009, there were 100,000 injuries reported in using trampolines. Uh, and a number of these were quadriplegic cases. Uh, and many involve children. They're much more likely to happen to children than to adults. So why would a church want to do this? Uh, so stay away from the ultra-hazardous activities. I recommend, Jerry, that the churches conduct uh, chess tournaments for the... Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of people wanting to go to camp with that sort of thing. So. Boy, that's going to be popular. <laughs> well, that's what I would have wanted. Uh, you know, stimulate the brain. And, uh, but, but so uh, watch out for those... Uh, ultra hazardous activities. Frankly, some activities such as trampolines are just too dangerous for youth to participate in. And, and then of course, be sure that you adequately screen all adults who are gonna be working with minors or screen adolescents who are gonna be working uh, with younger children. So you have to make sure these people are suitable for working with kids and that you have an adequate number of adequately trained adults. Any water event where lifeguards are not provided, you better have at least one individual that's a certified C in, uh, in resuscitation technique, CPR, that's right. Uh, another point I would make just in general is the, the, the value of benchmarking. And by that, of course, I mean uh, when you're not sure what to do to manage risk, Contact other charities in your community and find out what they're doing. Most importantly, the public schools, because they're a, an agent, an arm of your state. And that is an excellent indicator of what the general community standard of care is, that if you comply with, you are, you're in good shape in terms of establishing the exercise of reasonable care and that there was, uh, was no negligence. You've gone a long way in that direction. And uh, so we're going to be looking at some specific activities here, Jerry, and I'll turn it back over to you. So actually, you mentioned we need to run background checks, and we also need to do references on all the workers that will be working with children. But if you have a church that is actually coming in, and they're bringing their own workers, the, the camp doesn't really need to run background checks. They could probably get by with an affidavit from the pastor of that church 
saying that they've ran background checks and reference checks on their workers, and that should suffice, shouldn't it? I do. I believe that that's, that's the case. Okay. So we do need background checks and reference checks, but actually you can do an affidavit from that church asking for that they did the background checks and reference checks, and you can use that in lieu of you guys running background checks and paying double basically for this. That's in the case where a church has a facility that an outside group wants to use, or maybe you're like a denominational agency at a state level or national, and you're having a camping program, and you've got minors, and you, you need adult workers. Rather than you doing your own background checks and screening, I think this is your point, Jerry, right. on hundreds or maybe thousands of volunteer work, I've seen thousands in some of these cases of workers, counselors, supervisors, uh, to to transfer that risk to the local church that's providing these individuals, signing an affidavit indicating this person has been thoroughly screened, we've done reference checks, we know of no reason why this person would not be suitable for working with minors. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about camper ratios also. So a lot of people want to know what is the proper number of adults to children? So when you have children's six to eight years old. It depends on the activity, of course. Well, it does, but actually overall, the, the recommended number of workers, um, if you have people six to eight years old, you need one adult for six campers. And now where do you get that ratio? Um, actually, I got it from, uh, it, it's from the National Camp. Um, it's what's recommended. Okay. So uh, actually, I've seen it in several places, but we've had it in our book for, okay. for years. Uh, actually, I can tell you exactly where it comes from. I'll give, go ahead and give it to you. If they're nine to, 14 years, nine to 14 years old, one to every eight campers, and one, and if they're 15 to 18 years old, one to every 10 campers. So those are the ratios that you need to follow, and that is actually what is recommended. Um, By like the National Camping Association? Yeah, that, and, and actually most people use those exact ratios. It's actually, uh, that is correct. So actually, if you look at our risk management guide, which is online at agfinancial.org, you'll find it on page 15. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there's where we have the camp ratios. One of the other things that we suggest is that every camper sign an activity participation agreement. And that is actually part of the uh, guide also. And I'll just you can get it, and we'll have this online for you also. This is the activity participation agreement. It will actually list the activities, and parents can actually say no to activities. So, so this form is signed not by the, the minor, but by the parent. By the parents. Yeah. Preferably parents. both parents yes. uh, would sign on this. What it does is actually list the activities that you're going to be doing at camp. So let's say your child does not swim, so you don't want them swimming. You can actually put on this form you know, I do not want my child to swim, and we'll keep, you know, the camp will keep them from swimming. But it'll list the activities, and the parents can say no to it. It will also have an emergency contact if something happens. It will also list if they are approved to provide medical treatment if something happens. So if for some reason they have to go to the hospital, this gives them permission to take care of that. It also lists the health insurance so you know that the church is not responsible for the insurance. They'll also pick up the financial, personal financial or, responsibility. Or you may say that there is insurance, but it's at this level. It is and, at this level. And if level. you want more than that, it's your responsibility. Well, on the health insurance, this is, they're using their personal health insurance. So we know when they go to the hospital, who the hospital bills for the insurance. So we'll already have the copy of their, basically we'll know their insurance policy and uh, provider and I their see. policy number. Also, it lets them know something very important. Do they have any allergies? So many people when you go to camp are allergic to bee stings, peanuts. peanuts, and can have severe reactions where the throat will close up and basically they can stop breathing. So, and there's no medical qualified person there to assist. It's a disaster. It is, it's a disaster. So it's very important for the camp to know if people have certain allergies. So we, we suggest that they get an activity participation agreement for each participant that comes to um, a camp. It also has a very important thing which is a hold harmless agreement saying that the parents will not sue the church if something should happen. So, Of course that's of limited value Jerry because the, uh, they can't do that on behalf of their minor child. Right. The minor child has his or her own rights that, and 
uh, does not have to file a suit until they reach age 18 plus the statute of limitations. So if it's a three-year statute, they have until their 21st birthday. And the fact that mom signed that document, uh, all that can do is release her claims against the church, not the daughters. Well, and, and we've seen, we've both seen where the parents will still sue the church if something happens. Mm -hmm. They may actually get a settlement. And then actually I've had the lawsuit come in 10 years later from the child and they're asking, you know, filing against this on the exact right. same claim. So, so, so the parents, I think it's important to point out that the parents claim is with respect to the parents' injuries. So if a, if mom, a single parent family, a mom has an eight year old daughter that, it, that drowns in a church camp accident, uh, mom can sign a form holding harmless in, prior to the accident probably, uh, the, the church from any liability. And that, that uh, releases the church from liability for the mother's damages, the loss of companionship, the pain and suffering she's endured at the, at the thought of losing my eight-year-old child. But the child has her own claims of uh, you know, her pain and suffering, her death, the wrongful death, and, and so uh, if she survives, it's not a, a death claim, of course, but it's a pain and suffering, and her claims survive, uh, you know, don't, don't expire until the end of the statute of limitations that begins on her 18th birthday. But just, just remember, and a, the, the bottom line is this, an adult cannot release his or her child's, minor child's claims. That's the point. So well, I, I see churches do this all the time. They have parents sign release forms that, that are hastily put together and they attempt to release the church from any damages or any liability for injuries to my child during a particular uh, church event. And the, again, the parent can release his or her own claims, but cannot release the, the claims of the minor. So if you have a trampoline accident with a $5 million <laughs> verdict, that, you know, because of the damages to the child, that release that mom signed doesn't, doesn't provide any release of liability for the child. Exactly. Now, one of the other things that happens at camp so often is a lot of times there's going to be somebody filming all of the stuff that's going on mm -hmm. at the camp. And then they actually show it at the church and then they actually sell, a lot of times they'll sell the video of your experience at camp. You need to have a consent for taking those pictures. So As part so of the parents' uh, document that they sign, it can be an all-encompassing document Absolutely. that includes the the uh, the uh, what the uh, assumption of risk, indemnification, release of the parents' claims, uh, appointment of a person to make uh, emergency medical decisions in the event the parent can't be contacted. This this document, uh, parental consent, should ha include a number of things. But this is a very important component, I think, because uh, churches can bear some liability for uh, utilizing photos or videos of minors without consent. And that can, that can arise in a number of contexts. But, uh, so that's, I think, a very important point. At least get the parent's consent. You're not going to get the child's consent, because again, minors can't consent. But, but typically in these cases, it's the parents that are your, your primary concern. The other thing is make all the camp rules and conduct so they know how the child should act and how, what action you'll take if they're not following the rules. But have those camp rules and conduct, have that as, as part of your distribution to those parents. Emergency response plan. You need to have an emergency response plan if you have missing campers, for fire, if there's a fire issue, a weather issue, Tornado. Tornado. Um, you need to know how to fill out accident reports if somebody does get injured. The Boy Scouts were sued a few years ago because of a death, because of a tornado at a camp, at a Boy Scout camp. Wow. And then medical procedures. What medical procedures happen? One, one thing that most people don't know, you may have a nurse at camp, but I was actually doing some research on this after one of the, our large churches brought this to my attention and it actually was a registered nurse they had a registered nurse, they can't actually distribute any medication without a doctor's consent. So if, if you have a person that has, is taking some kind of medicine, not only do they have to have permission to, to give that medicine, for them to legally do it, they have to have a doctor's consent along with that. Um, and actually, I don't, you know, how many times do nurses, you know, give Epidril or even aspirin to some, some child. Well, technically, you have to have 
a doctor's consent in order to do that. And that's something that, you know, we found out not that long ago. One of the other things that um, happens at camps, a lot of times they have four wheelers or golf carts that they'll drive people down to the lake. Um, how many times do we see, you know, a 15 year old kid driving down to the lake and they've got eight kids on the, on the golf cart? Not a good idea. People fall off of golf, golf carts. And, and actually we had a very bad case where they had four kids on the back of a golf cart and they went over a bump and boom, two of them fell off and when they landed, hurt their back. So they should be, golf carts and or four-wheelers should be dri driven by licensed drivers only and kids should not be riding on them. Um, not, at least not without parental supervision or an adult supervisor. Yeah, you get somebody that's old enough and you've got enough seats, but you gotta watch for overcrowding. Mm -hmm. um, smoke alarms, fire extinguishers in each dorm and meeting room should be a must. Okay, now let's talk about swimming pools. One of the biggest things, one of the largest amount of claims that we see at camps has to do with swimming. So we're going to let's break this down between swimming pools and a lake. But let's let's talk about what we need to do at swimming pools. Well, uh, let's just talk about swimming in general. But if you want, you want to talk about swimming pools, or just, just let's swimming start with swimming pools, okay. and then we'll go to then we'll swimming go to oceans lakes. and yeah. lakes. Yeah. Well, uh, with swimming pools, there are a number of ways this can, can happen. There, there are a few churches, not many, that have a facility where they have their own swimming pool. But most of the time when churches want to utilize a swimming pool, typically in a youth activity, they're going to go to some other facility, a municipal pool, a hotel pool, uh, or it's, you know, some water park, that kind of thing. But the, I, I think the important point I would make is the value of utilizing, let's say, a municipal swimming pool because of the fact that they provide the, uh, the lifeguards. And so you're basically transferring risk to, from the church to the municipality that operates that pool. I know I was involved in a case a few years ago. It was a horrible case of a 10-year-old girl. Well, it was actually a church that owned a camp. It was a, it was a state denominational agency that owned a camp. And they had all kinds of children's programs there over the course of the summer. But they, they used to have a pool and they closed it down just out of concern of the, of the risk. And what they did is they put the kids in a bus and they drove about 15 miles to the nearest municipal pool. It was a very large pool and it was, it was uh, sufficient for the, the kids that they brought. And they had about 10 or 12 lifeguards on duty surrounding this pool. And it was during one of those swimming events that this girl drowned. And uh, so the, uh, the, the girl's parents sued the church organization and said, you're, you're responsible for our daughter's death. And that case was, was dismissed by the court because the church had no liability because it had, it had utilized the municipal pool, which according to the agreements that they signed, effectively the, the church didn't maintain or, uh, or retain any responsibility to supervise the event. That was entirely on the part of the city and its uh, staff. So, uh, you know, that, that case and others have, have just really reinforced in my mind the importance of utilizing facilities that have trained lifeguards on staff who become responsible for the safety of the minors in your church that are utilizing that pool. And of course, as you said, Jerry, have the parents sign uh, a permission form of some sort that where they consent to their child participating in an, an event that involves swimming, wherever that may be, indicating whether their child knows how to swim or not is very important. Uh, so those are some of the key points I'd make. So if you have a swimming pool, number one, you have to have trained lifeguards. Your pool rules need to be posted. If you have a sw your own swimming pool? Yes, if you have a swimming pool at the camp. You need to have pool markings with the water depth. No diving in shallow water. And as a matter of fact, you need to warn against head first entry. And, and actually the first time you see it happening in the shallow end, you need to give a warning. Next time you kick them out. As a matter of fact, 95% of neck and back injuries that happen from diving 
are in less than five foot of water. And you want to talk about one of the large case that uh, that you know about that? Uh, yes, yes. These these can be exceedingly uh, high dollar value cases when you're de dealing with spinal injuries. Uh, there was a case in an eastern state uh, recently where a a, a worker uh, at a camp at a church. I don't know if it was a church facility, but it was a charity of some sort. Uh, actually, was utilizing a inflatable slide on the side of a cement swimming pool, and went up to the top of this this rubber inflatable uh, ladder, and and went down, and uh, actually went down head first, and the the bottom of that slide collapsed under his weight, and he hit his head on the cement uh, edge of the pool. And that resulted in permanent uh, quadriplegia. And, and that case uh, was resolved by a jury for, it was upward of uh, t over $20 million. So just imagine your church with your 100,000 or 1 million, whatever it may be, liability policy. And you have a catastrophic accident like that because somebody dove uh, in a crazy manner off a, off a rubber inflatable slide. You say, well, we got rid of the real slide, uh, uh, diving board. Well, that's fine. But you know, using these inflatable things can be a risk, just like if, the kid, if this individual had dove into two feet of water and hit his head and, and became a quadriplegic. There are many of these cases each year, and the dollar value can be absolutely astronomical, way in excess of the, of, the, of the insurance proceeds of the church. Yeah, it was amazing when I was doing a study on this, I saw so many cases and it seemed like $10 million was the mark. I mean, it, you know, if you have an injury and, and you do not warn somebody for going head first and you do not give proper supervision, $10 million seems to be the case. And I don't know what your church uh, has insurance wise from an umbrella standpoint, but it, you know, if you're going to have a swimming pool, it's good to have at least $10 million worth of liability, but more important, it's better to give better supervision and have those lifeguards really giving warning signs because exactly what's going to end up happening is when it goes to court, they're going to say, what did you do? How did you do this? And if you didn't have warnings, you know, you saw it happen and you didn't warn or you didn't kick somebody out and they continue to do it, you're going to be held liable. Mm -hmm. So and warning signs are part of the risk management, but they're not necessarily always going to be effective. But no. we highly recommend the use of them. Uh, but for example, if someone dives in at night when it's dark, uh, or is uh, somebody that can't read English, uh, maybe because of he's, he's four years old or something. So there's a number of potential exceptions here, but that doesn't discount the value of using them. Absolutely, and you need to have the proper, you need to have no diving marked in your shallow water. I mean, a lot of pools, older pools didn't have that, so you need to have that. And of course, having adult supervision that it stays on top of this and immediately stops this kind of activity. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that really surprised me when I was going through this is warn against breath holding for prolonged underwater swimming. Yes, nobody should hold their breath more than 10 minutes. You know, uh, well, underwater. actually, I'll tell you a little bit less than that. And actually, uh, the Navy SEALs actually is how I found this out. It's called shallow water blackout. And it, and it results in drowning. And, and it's, it's the less known but most deadly um, activity that actually happens at swimming pools. And, and, and actually, my, my brother has a swimming pool. I can't tell you how many times we would dive off the diving board, swim to one side, try to swim back to the other side and see how far we could get. Underwater. Underwater. Yeah. And um, I had never heard of this until actually I was reading uh, about some of the lawsuits and stuff because they, people allowed this to happen. So if you see this happening, you need to, to warn and tell people, sorry, you can't do this in the swimming pool. Now, one of the most important things that I think is swimmers need to take a swimming test. So if we have swimmers, you're gonna have people that, are not, that have never been swimming, never been in the water. You're gonna have people that are very proficient at swimming and can swim back and forth and do everything. You need to give swimming tests to all the people that come to the swimming pool. We suggest, actually, that you have bracelets for each swimmer. It'll be a red bracelet. Little rubber bracelets. Well, they're, they're bracelets that people, that the kids can't take off. So they're, they're on the wrist and they, you know, they have a permanent like attachment. Okay, well, so that's while good. the time Otherwise they're in the can. Yeah. So you can't get it off the wrist, okay? So you get a red bracelet if you're not allowed in the water. 
You can have a yellow bracelet if you're in the shallow water, but it can't go above your head. And you have a green bracelet if you can swim anywhere. So uh, I know Church Mutual Insurance Company actually offers those to all of their um, all of their churches free of charge. And all you have to do is go to the website and ask for them, and they'll send them to you. Um, and I know a lot of our camps That's a great idea. actually will, will take advantage of that. And I'm talking, I've got, you know, camps normally will have a thousand kids, so they send a thousand bracelets, but it's a great thing. Have life jackets for non-swimmers. So that's another thing we can talk about. Now let's talk about swimming at the lake. Um, there's lots of things that happen at a lake, but again, I would say you need to post your rules. One of those rules needs to be no night swimming, okay? So um, it's dark, the lake is normally away, there's, it's not lighted, and we need to make sure that there is no night swimming. So you need to clearly post that. We've had claims that have happened because it was not posted that there was no night swimming. So that's number one. Number two, um, I suggest that everybody wears a life jacket when entering the lake. Most lakes are not crystal clear water, especially around here in the Ozarks. Um, as a matter of fact, you can't see probably two foot down in most lakes. So if somebody is underwater, you're not gonna be able to tell that there is somebody under there. So we suggest that everybody wears life jackets. You've got paddle boats, you've got canoes that can tip over. Using those, they need to wear life jackets. Um, blobs, water trampolines, um, you need to follow the manufacturer's rules, no exceptions, period. Um, I think that's a very important rule, no matter what the device is absolutely. that's used in conjunction with any water event, whether it's an inflatable, whether it's a slide, whether it's a diving board, whatever, the manufacturer will contain a, will have to prevent or to manage its own risk of liability for products liability, it will have a long list of conditions and requirements uh, for use. And it's essential that somebody be in charge of reviewing that and make sure that those conditions are implemented. Absolutely. Yeah, that's going to be fun. I'm going to read this 20 pages of microscopic prints like a U-Haul contract. Uh, but yeah, that's right. Somebody needs to do that because you're going to be asked that on the witness stand in the event of a death or injury. Who read the manufacturer's conditions and why didn't you follow these? Well, none of us did. We didn't want to read that. Uh, you're not going to want to say that. So somebody should be tasked with that responsibility and make sure that there's compliance with the manufacturer's uh, requirements. You know, actually, I almost suggest that I'd be okay with not having any water trampolines, period, because trampolines are just bad news everywhere. But with the blobs, you have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. So many, so many people would like to get a heavier kid with a younger kid to see how high they can get that little kid in the air. And I'm talking 40, 50 feet. You go to YouTube and you can watch some of the things because actually I have youth pastors calling me all the time saying, Oh, we've got this great new activity for the lake. It's called a blob. And they said, there's never been an accident on a blob. Well, I can tell you that I know of two deaths personally that have happened because I've seen them happen with churches that we help uh, where they've had deaths at blobs. So, I mean, go to YouTube and you watch and you can see the injuries that happen. Um, another so what do you say about blobs then? I prefer not to have blobs, to tell you the truth. Uh, I'd rather them have the paddle boats, have the canoes. The chess tournaments. You know, your chess tournaments. But, uh, you know, I'd probably, I would, I suggest that if you can stay away from a blob, you stay away from a blob. There's a lot of blobs out there. There's a lot of risk. And I'll tell you, if you're going to use them at an absolute minimum, you need to thoroughly uh, review the manufacturer's instructions and make sure you have strict compliance with those. They're not going to allow 300 pound kids to jump on a blob and throw a 100 pound kid, uh, you know, 50 feet in the air. That, that, no, the instructions are going to prohibit that. So for you to allow it, then you are subjecting yourself to an enhanced risk of liability. You know, just like we thought, we thought we'd be able to get through these two sections, but there's a lot of things that happens at camp and other summer activities that we haven't been able to discuss this time. And we're going to have to follow back up on that probably in August because on July 22nd, 
we're going to have a panel of church administrators join us and they're going to ask us questions that happen at their church and these are uh, church administrators from here in southwest missouri and all around that are going to be asking us questions so we're going to have a group of around five maybe a little bit more uh, admin church administrators that are just going to ask us questions so we're going to have a fun time on july 22nd make sure that you're here we appreciate your time again and we look forward to seeing you next time for Risk Management Live. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Jerry.